This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to every single one of you out there, including Tim Deputy, Brandon Brooks, Hector Bones, and Ryan Ambrose. On this episode of DTNS, can you use generative AI tools securely in your business? LinkedIn CISO Jeff Belknap helps us understand the risks and the rewards. Plus, the Microsoft Activision Blizzard merger essential facts. And is it farewell to Blu-ray? <gasps> Say it ain't so. Best Buy. This is the Daily Tech News for October the 13th, Friday. October Friday. It's Friday the 13th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from studio Jason Voorhees' mom, I'm Sarah Lane. <laughs> Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us, the Chief Information and Security Officer at LinkedIn, Jeff Belknap. Welcome to DTNS, Jeff. Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm joining you live from the bottom of my stairs. Yeah, nice stairs, by the way. That it was a stairs. good stairs. Yeah, good stairs. strong, strong stairs. A stair lot of people game. go for cool garage looks, but yeah. I feel like keeping it humble is the <laughs> yeah. right move. I like it. No, Shots it's a, it's a good fired, move. Jeff. Could be the move. All right, yeah. All right folks. Uh, Meta sent its response to the EU about moderation practices, keeping you updated on all the letters flying. Uh, we'll see if the EU follows up with a formal request for information, as it did with X. But now, the rest of the quick hits. Starlink's satellite service, Direct to Call, is on track to roll out uh, its SMS service starting in early 2024, according to the company. Eventually, the system announced back in August of 2022 in a partnership with T-Mobile is meant to connect IoT devices through the LTE standard, with T-Mobile setting aside some 5G spectrum for use by Starlink's second-gen satellites. And Starlink also letting T-Mobile phones access the satellite network, giving the satellite, uh, the cell service provider, rather, near complete coverage of the U.S. So kind of a good handshake deal. Yeah. Resin-coated copper, or RCC, is a technology that lets circuit boards be designed slimmer. Uh, Apple's been investigating using RCC in its chips, which would free up space in phones so you could have a larger battery, put in some other components, or just make the phone smaller. Analyst Ming-Chi Kuo's sources say that Apple has found the technology so far to be a little fragile, and they haven't quite got it to pass the drop test yet. So it looks like it won't show up into iPhones until 2025. Ehong, which is the company based in the Chinese city of Guangzhou, announced that it's received an airworthiness type certificate from the Civil Aviation Administration, China's version of the FAA, for its fully autonomous human passenger carrying drone. The EH-216S AAV is the first drone in the world to receive such a certification. Ehang CEO Wazi Hu expects the company's two-person AAV to start expanding overseas next year. A couple of notes here regarding TikTok's ongoing battle to stay afloat in various markets. U.S. District Judge Donald Malloy heard arguments challenging the state of Montana's ban of TikTok. Judge Malloy said the state had a paternalistic attitude, in the judge's words, and asked if it seemed strange that Montana was the only U.S. state to enact such a ban. Meanwhile, Malaysia said TikTok is not fully compliant with local laws there because it has not done enough to combat defamatory and misleading content on the platform. TikTok has responded by saying it is taking proactive measures to address those issues. Elsewhere, Vietnam is conducting a probe into harmful content on TikTok, and we've talked before about Indonesia forbidding TikTok from engaging in e-commerce in that country. NASA's Psyche, a three-ton spacecraft mission, is set to launch from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida Friday. In fact, it might have happened as of this recording, kicking off a six-year trip to an asteroid belt that could offer insight into the formation of not only Earth, but other planets that have rocks. Psyche, the spacecraft, is named for an asteroid that NASA's been tracking for around 26 months and will cover around 2.2 billion miles with help from plasma engines. Hey, look at that. There's going to be some good stuff they bring back uh, from that asteroid, I think. I hope so, yeah. Well, listen, if we could do it without a copyright infringement, we would blast Etta James's ad loud. 
us right now because after 20 months, Microsoft and Activision Blizzard are finally one company. The UK CMA has approved the deal and it's done. Here's some important things to know, Tom. Tell us. All right. Yeah, let's let's run down. You may have heard some of these. You may have not. Uh, <laughs> the first one you probably have heard, because Sarah basically just said it, Activision Blizzard, now part of Microsoft, uh, specifically part of the Xbox division under Phil Spencer. Uh, 8,500 employees coming from Activision Blizzard there. Nine game studios now join Microsoft, making Microsoft the third largest game company by revenue in the world behind Tencent and Sony. Uh Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick will leave the company at the end of the year. He's going to stick around to help with the transition. End of the year, he's out. U.S. Federal Trade Commission is still pursuing a lawsuit against the merger. If you're like, wait, what about the U.S.? But don't forget, the FTC lost court cases to prevent the merger from happening. So the best the FTC could hope for is win a court case somehow and someday unwind the merger. But that seems very unlikely at this point. To get the UK's agreement, which is the thing they got Friday, which allowed this to close, Microsoft agreed to license non-European worldwide cloud streaming rights for all Activision Blizzard games made over the next 15 years to Ubisoft. Now, this is the thing that you're going to want to remember in the future. A separate agreement within the European economic area requires Microsoft to share those streaming rights with any other game company that wants to. So Microsoft holds the rights in Europe, but if NVIDIA says, hey, we'd like them on NVIDIA Shield, Microsoft has to accommodate them. Outside of Europe, Microsoft is giving all those rights to Ubisoft, and we'll have to reach an agreement with Ubisoft in order to add any Activision Blizzard games to its own cloud streaming service. Uh, so the reason this is important is in the future, it probably won't happen, but let's say there's a game you're like, hey, why is this on the Xbox Cloud everywhere except Europe? Or why is it only on Xbox Cloud in Europe and not elsewhere? This would be why, because you've got two different systems for that going on. Let's also take a moment to recognize Candy Crush maker King, which is also part of this deal. Uh, in fact, executives have started using the name Activision Blizzard King. Uh, Bobby Kotick will remain CEO of Activision Blizzard King until the end of the year, for example. Uh, King gets its due in a new trailer from Microsoft as well that shows off the wealth of games that are now part of the Microsoft family. That includes World of Warcraft, Call of Duty, Halo, Diablo, Fallout, Crash Bandicoot, Starfield, Forza, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, Minecraft, Candy Crush, and of course, the OG, Reversi. I'm sorry, I meant Microsoft Flight Simulator, but Reversi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, small titles you may not have heard about. Um, you know, they started in Brooklyn. But um, I, I guess my question is, like, could the FTC possibly screw this up down the road I after mean, what, what, you know, yeah. where we are today? Anything is possible, right? Uh, and it does look like they are going to continue to pursue the administrative judge uh, procedure, but they're likely to lose that. And if they lose that, it's over uh, by, yeah. by, by all accounts. However, if they pull off something unlikely and win that, then Microsoft would likely take them into court to overturn it. Uh, and it is not likely that they would be that Microsoft would lose in court since they they courts seemed favorable to the merger based on not giving the injunctions. So uh, again, in a world where anything is possible, sure, possible, sure. probable. Yeah. Mm, no, it, it it does not seem probable. This is this, this is, could be this a is fun video game in the future. <laughs> in a world where anything is possible, can the FTC take down one of the biggest mm, mergers yeah. of all gaming time? Could uh, I'm not sure which which game studio, probably not Activision Blizzard, uh, <laughs> would put that out. But who knows? Maybe they would. Yeah. Well, it seems like it was just two weeks ago that Netflix ended its DVD subscription delivery service. It was two weeks ago. Yeah. And we talked about it at that point. Um, and many of us, you know, poured out a little liquor, had a little cry or said, eh. Who even uses those anymore? Well, a lot of people use physical media. Now, multiple reports say that Best Buy is allegedly set to also do away with physical media sales 
early next year. Blu-ray, DVD, both on the chopping block. That would be in-store and online, with Best Buy being some of the best of the uh, options that you still have in the United States, which are fairly limited at this point. So you've got Walmart, you've got Target, you've got Redbox, if you like physical media. You certainly have uh, independent options as well. Jeff, I want to punt this over to you. Are you a physical media person, and does this bother you? I am not a physical media person. It doesn't bother me right now, but if we had to go back in time, I think it would bother me sometime around 2010, 2005. Uh, mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. I yeah. don't know how to insert DVDs into my Apple TV, but right after this, we should <laughs> try. <laughs> yes, let's try. Yeah, maybe it'll be a GDI thing. Yeah, I mean, I I'm I'm with you, Jeff. I I simply don't have a place for physical media in my home theater setup right now because uh, I don't need one. But a lot of people, especially DTNS listeners, uh, do really care about uh, physical media, where whether it be, you know, vinyl or DVDs or, I don't know, cassette tapes or whatever. Just having that physical thing in your library is important. So end of an era, I suppose, or we're getting to the end. I just popped a Blu-ray out of my PS5 yesterday. So I'm, I'm the iconoclast here that still has them. But I haven't bought one at Best Buy probably since before the date that Jeff just mentioned as the last time uh, he thought about them. Because I get them for very specific reasons from like a music group, for instance, directly from that music group. Uh, and I think what this story is telling us is that Blu-rays and DVDs, especially Blu-rays, have gone niche you can still buy cassettes. In fact, cassettes are ha- making it a little bit of a comeback right now. Best Buy itself still sells vinyl. It sells LPs. It stopped for a while. It started stocking them again because well, they are rising they in popularity. Popular. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't see this as the you know underlying period death of Blu-ray. This is the moment that Blu-ray has become niche. Uh, and it may or may not ever get out of being niche, but I imagine it's still going to be around for a long time just based on the fact that we still have cassettes, we still have LPs. Both of those have made a comeback. I don't think Blu-ray and DVD are in the eight-track category where you're only going to find them in thrift stores. This is probably the beginning, though, of uh, of feeling regret for all those things that you throw away from your garage, like the original mm. DVD of uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. This is the beginning of them being cool again. So One 10 years from movies. now, you're going to wish you had all those things that you threw away. 10 years from now, are we going to be covering the story that Best Buy has started carrying Blu-rays again because of the nostalgia wave for DVDs, right? I, th- I think. I mean, if that, you want to go nostalgia, let's go VHS, okay? yeah. All yeah. right, let's take it back. VHS might be in the 8-track category, actually. I'm not I sure. think it kind of, I mean, gosh, as far as like degradation over the mm-hmm. years it very much is i can't uh, wait for the Pete... arguments about how it's just warmer on vhs it's just a better tone <laughs> on VHS. the color tones are <laughs> yeah. warmer yeah. yeah betamax never really had that, that they never those, really got that right those tracking marks just give it a certain je ne sais quoi that <laughs> it's realer that way yeah yeah uh, I mean, there's a lot of 80s nostalgia going on right now, so I'm, I'm not going to be terribly shocked if something like that popped its head. I up mean, right listen, if if a company uh, of, you know, Best Buy's um, caliber says, we're not moving the merch when it comes to physical media, I... I completely understand why it just doesn't make sense anymore. You have less foot traffic, the people who go. My mom the other day went into Best Buy to look at a TV that she Mm -hmm. was going to buy online, but, you know, wanted to see it in person. I think in many cases, uh, companies like this serve as that it's like the bookstore, like go and see something and then buy it online for cheaper. Yeah. And people who want Blu-rays, they don't need to go look at it in the store first. They can just buy it on Amazon. They can, yeah. you know, buy it on exactly. Walmart.com, which is why Walmart and Amazon are continuing to carry them. Uh, folks, uh, we have another show on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash daily tech news show called Tom's Top Five, uh, where I break down five things to know usually about technology. And this week's episode is going to save you money because this week's episode is how to save money on your next tech purchase. Uh, our 
our in-house money-saving expert, Roger Chang, uh, came up with this idea <laughs> and, and wrote most of this script. Uh, so don't pay full price. Watch Tom's Top 5 at youtube.com slash Daily Tech News Show and save yourself some money. Every day is filled with AI-related news. Here's a few examples. Uh, in the Phantom Liberty downloadable content for Cyberpunk 2077, uh, the voice of a Polish language actor who has passed away was generated by an algorithm. Scientists at Northwestern University have developed a transistor built from molybdenum disulfide and carbon nanotubes that can run AI processes using 100 times less electricity than silicon transistors. So you could run AI locally on a smartwatch. Google has joined Microsoft, Adobe, and others in indemnifying users for using its AI products. If you are challenged on copyright grounds, Google will assume responsibility for the potential legal risks involved. And earlier this week, the U.S. Space Force paused the use of AI tools like ChatGPT while it evaluates their security. And that last one, security, is a growing area of concern when using these tools. One that our guest today, uh, Jeff Belknap, has thought a lot about. Jeff, thanks for discussing this with us today. What are what are your top of mind concerns if a company wants to integrate these tools, these generative AI tools? Yeah, I'm usually concerned about molybdenum disulfide and carbon nanotubes, but I think uh, <laughs> thinking about the prevalence don't eat them. Of, of AI, yeah. <laughs> don't eat them and don't uh, put them in your washing machine. They're not Tide Pods. Uh, the, <laughs> the important thing is we're at a phase with, uh, with AI that everybody is super excited about it, but we're still looking at where's this really going to add value in the businesses and the organizations that we're running today? There's a bunch of gadgets and we're sort of in this experimentation phase. So I think what we look for for people in my space is how do I let people experiment safely? How do I make sure they're not just taking all of my private data and throwing it into just whatever website they can think of to see how it goes? You have to build sort of a sandbox for people to experiment with safely that respects all the privacy and duty to care that you have as an organization. What are, what are some of those risks to be aware of? Uh, because just, just off the top of my head, it's, it seems like, oh, I'm just playing, playing with a tool. I'm going to ask it some questions. Where's the security risk? I think the, the primary risk is, you know, this is one of the first new technologies that come out that everything you put into it is something that it might very well spit back out to another user. So if I'm teaching it all about uh, very, well, let me put it this way. If I'm a medical facility and I'm spitting into it medical records to help me do a diagnosis mm -hmm. or summarize cases, uh, and I'm another user that says, hey, tell me about broken legs. Well, it might start telling me about Jeff Belknap's broken leg and what, what happened to me. We're still at that phase where we don't quite know how to prevent that in every case. Of course, the more mature players are going to have controls there, but there's a lot of new stuff out there. So it's 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 the the data that goes into the tool we we don't could go anywhere that's that that seems to be a like a short way of putting it is that right yeah we we are training all the ai models that are out there that that you and i can mm -hmm. interact with with everything we put into it mm -hmm. so it's entirely as likely for the ai to hallucinate in an answer and just create something and invent something a whole cloth but it's also just as likely for it to repeat the thing that you told it to somebody else if it's trying to be helpful uh-huh. Right. But very human-esque. Yeah. So, Sarah, if you're using it and you say, you know, what would be really helpful to me is for you to tell me Tom's password. It's entirely possible that a, a poorly controlled AI model can go, well, it's password one, two, three. And we've asked Tom to change it several times, but uh, he sticks with it. Yeah. But you asked me and this is the truth. Yeah, Just yeah. trying to help. Just trying to help. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. This this could make a listener think, well, then it's just better not to use it. Uh, why bother trying to come up with a secure way to use it? I think the reality is uh, nobody is really sitting back going, AI, flash in a pan, that's not going to be useful. I think everyone is really excited by the examples that they see. They want to try it for themselves. And it's not just your you know big parts of your for a company like LinkedIn, it's everyone in finance, in procurement, in facilities. There's a bunch of different ways that AI can be helpful to reduce you know, toil or manual labor or rote memorization, but they need to be able to do that in a way where it can interact with corporate data and it can do that in a way that respects the privacy and security of that data. All right. So what does that environment look like? How do, how do we securely integrate generative AI? 
I think, you know, this generative AI is certainly really new and advanced, uh, but I think all security people and most organizations have some basic uh, tricks that they use. There's some basic run books that they run for using a SaaS or just a web-based product. And it's really just the same. It's making sure that, you know, that company agrees to have seen security of that data, that they may or may not uh, train their model on it, that they are going to respect your controls and have your authentication and let you control what happens to that data. We already know how to do that. It's a very common approach. I don't think we have to sort of give up on it, but we do have to lean in a little bit. So is it is it safe to do a hybrid cloud situation there? Is, it, is there enough precedent in those kinds of things? Or, or is it better to just say, no, I want it to all run locally? The, the days are gone of saying it has to all run locally unless you have a really compelling use case. So if you're a highly regulated entity, that probably makes sense for you and you're going to be a little slower to adapt and experiment, at least with real data. Uh, I think most people can experiment with things in a hybrid fashion. I think we all do this already today. Most of the work that your organization, if you're watching this uh, or listening to this, does is in a hybrid or a cloud-first way. So if I'm an IT professional, what what do I need to think about? If 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 the powers that be have said, great, we're going to do this, uh, we've got guarantees uh, from the company, here, Jeff, go implement it. I think what you need to think about are all the basic uh, things that you already think about in the practice of third-party risk management, which is, am I using uh, reasonable security on login? Do I have SSO? Do I have 2FA? Uh, if I've assured that all the security controls are in place, how do I just make it easy for my users to use? Because the thing to remember is the value that people like we uh, the, in the security space add is enabling us to do hard things as a business, enabling the business to grow and thrive and move into new areas. And if you're accelerating that, that is your job. If you're saying no and we have to wait, people are going to work around you anyway. So think about uh, your SSO, think about your logs, think about all mm -hmm. the things you would use for any other SaaS base. I think you'll be very happy with the results. Do you think there's still a need to train people about what not to enter into like a chat GPT, even if you've got the assurances, like we're not worried about open AI seeing it. We're not worrying about anybody outside the company seeing it, but are there concerns about, well, we, this department within the company shouldn't see it and we don't want it leaking out that way. Yeah. I, I think it's really safe to run a, a standard awareness campaign where you tell people at a base level just because we've got an approved uh, generative AI platform in-house doesn't mean that you have blanket authority or blanket, blanket agency to add corporate data into every generative AI tool you can think of. You got to remind <laughs> people where the, safe, where the guardrails are, where the safe space is. And then just in general, you're going to remind people to be thoughtful about using data that you need, that you have some business use to do, and that you have consent to use in that way. Yeah. Don't ask it about your broken leg. Don't ask it about my broken leg. Sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, if 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 there's one thing I'm curious about with everyone is what what are the things that you particularly think might be beneficial to using these kinds of tools? Is there something that excites you about it? I think you know, for me, what's really exciting is uh, I'm a big fan of people getting into complicated technology spaces like security or engineering or tech in general. And I think AI, while people are very scared about it replacing you know, humans or entry-level employees, it really eliminates that toil that you might do at an entry-level job or eliminates the need for really laborious, unfun uh, things that you might do in tech jobs. And instead, it lets you focus on the things that really add value to the organization that might accelerate your career even faster. So I'm pretty excited about it being something that enables people to focus on the skills that they need to succeed in a challenging space instead of just learning how to do rote manual labor. Yeah. Just uh, instead of just cranking through a spreadsheet, you can you can have the AI do that and work on more conceptual stuff. I, right. I like that too. Yeah. Yeah. You're the manager of your AI. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. You can all put. Well, uh, if you're the manager of your AI or just somebody who might be traveling later this year or early next year, you might have heard some stuff about bed bugs, unfamiliar mattresses, might be the place where bed bugs would be a problem. You don't want them. And if you say, I'm worried about this, you aren't alone. But Chris Christensen has some potentially good news. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. 
I suspect that bed bugs may have been a problem way back in Marco Polo's day, but there are some new companies that are trying to fight hotel bed bug infestations with high tech. One of the most interesting ones I saw was Spata that uses AI powered insect detection systems for bed bugs. It's about the size of a pack of cards and it can be placed wherever bed bugs might be present and it uses advanced image recognition algorithms to detect bed bugs. Other companies like Delta 5 are using electronic lures or even pheromones to try and capture bed bugs. It's an old problem with some new solutions. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. I mean, I've heard us all slightly chuckle about this, but we all want to get rid of bed bugs, right? This is I'm not against like them. Yeah. Yeah, like this is not sort of like a mm, bed bugs both sides. No. Let's get rid of the bed bugs. <laughs> is, any, okay. is anybody pro bed bug? That's a, I feel like you should. I don't that think person. so. The yeah. bed bugs. That, that, that's the only ones I could think of. Though. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, the bed bugs. Won't somebody think of the bed bugs? <laughs> I love that we're uh, playing AI. Just get out of problem. my hotel and you're good. Yeah. I thought the, uh, the the training of an image recognition algorithm to, to find the bed bugs is particularly a good example of what I'm excited about with AI, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to hook it up to a laser and you could, uh, you know, uh, precisely eliminate any detected uh, bed bugs. Yeah, mm. see, then you get the UN involved, though, and they're going to have a Bed bug carnage. That, so. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. know, Jeff. The, the bed bug UN uh, representation is... Strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, whether... Uh, it, actually, yes, if you are in favor of bed bugs somehow, <laughs> I'm very curious to hear from you. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, until then, let's check out what else is in the mailbag. <sighs> Longtime patron Andrew wrote in that his ears perked up when we mentioned his current home of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, Andrew says, a year or so ago, we voted to uh, allow municipal internet like many other parts of the state have. Earlier this year, the local utility company started la lading, laying fiber as part of a multi-year upgrade. I already had the pleasure of watching the utility company dig up and repair my easement. I suspect we got bumped to the front of Comcast's new rollout because there are now competitors offering one gig plus fiber in the city and almost all the lines are buried. So I appreciate that they aren't coming from my easement as well. Well, there you go. Yeah. A uh, little municipal uh, broadband, a little competition. Uh, and then in Comcast's favor, uh, they don't have to dig up your easement because they're running it over existing coaxial uh, cable. Jeff, I don't know if you heard this story, but but Comcast announced its two gig service with Doxis 4.0 over the existing cables. So they don't have to lay new cables for it. It's it's amazing. I used to be in telecommunications engineering early in my career. And I remember this moment where we ran uh, a huge conduit of fiber up and down New York State. And then we found out within two years, we basically the, the conduit would be half empty because we found out how to run more and more over mm. one piece of fiber. And now we're doing yeah. the same in RF and copper. Really cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. As long as it comes to my house, that that's, makes it even cooler. Than, I, yeah. can, I can tell you as a guy who has fiber directly to his house, it is amazing. And I don't think I'd move anywhere else that didn't have it. <laughs> I, I totally get that. Yeah, can't go back. All right, let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been illustrating today's show. Len, what have you drawn for us today? You know, I am probably... Uh, to blame for Best Buy getting rid of their DVDs. Just like <laughs> you guys, I did not uh, purchase, I have not purchased a physical media piece in, in years, maybe as a gift for somebody. But I thought this being Jul um, July 4th, Friday the 13th, <laughs> rather, uh, it sort of fit well with, with the theme. Oh, this yeah. Best Buy yeah. is slashing this. Uh, this is a Best Buy slasher. I call that this, and uh, it's destroy. You know, it's Jason destroying the the DVDs, the Blu-rays, the 4K ultras. You know, it's just very, very sad. Honestly, very so, spooky, very uh, sad, very spooky. So anyway, this is. <laughs> Uh, this is available at my Patreon, patreon.com. Jason Voorhees, how Len. sad for him. Len, yes. he killed a lot of people. All right. No, no, we're sad for the Blu-rays and not, not, not yeah, for Jason. Okay. We're yeah, not right. excusing. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Let's yeah. just make sure we're, yeah. Mm. 
be in the uh, You can get this at my Patreon, <laughs> patreon.com forward slash Len, or at my online store, lenperaltestore.com, uh, where I'm also starting to take uh, stuff for uh, Christmas cards, holiday cards. Mm. So think about that as we move forward. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Oh, we will. Uh, Jeff Belknap, uh, thanks so much for joining us. You're a real natural. Hope you come back. <laughs> come back soon. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work uh, in the meantime. Uh, you can find me on this neat little website I just found called LinkedIn. So uh, LinkedIn.com. Hey, that's me. Uh, and you can find me there. And occasionally I'm talking about stuff to do with security. I'm talking about uh, things that annoy me, like my kids walking on my stove. Check out all that and more free on my content. Excellent. And uh, a big thanks to uh, our, our friend David Spark uh, at CISO Series for, for putting us in touch with you, Jeff. Uh, it was great having you on, man. Yeah, if you thought this was great, you can thank David Spark and check out CISOSeries.com. If you thought this was awesome and the worst, or not awesome, the worst thing ever, uh, you can also find David Spark <laughs> at CISOSeries.com. <laughs> you could, like, yeah, either way. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, if you're a patron, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's time again for the great GDI debates. It's Friday. We have some fun. Tackle some of the most hotly debated questions of our time. Stick around. Just a reminder, DTNS is live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Hope you all have a great weekend. We're back on Monday with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Our social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast adds support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Chris Christensen. And our guest this week was Jeff Belknap. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>